Welcome to another episode of the Misal Podcast. In this 46th episode, I am joined by Akbar Tejani. He is a co-founder and CEO at BFiler, a Karachi-based fintech providing tax and business advisory services. Having recently raised $1.5 million in seed funding, Akbar talks about why he decided to go the venture capital route for a service-based business, building a tech stack that scales with growth, and some of the challenges that he faced while scaling. Let's listen in. Welcome uh, to the Misal Podcast, Akbar. How are you? Very well, thank you, G. Thanks for joining me. I, I know it was uh, you probably were inundated with a lot of requests uh, similar to mine. Uh, you recently announced your $1.5 million seed and congratulations on that. Uh, I would love to ask you a little bit more questions about that. But before we jump to that, can you please tell me a little bit about yourself and what is the problem that you're trying to solve with BFiler? Okay, so my name is Akbar Tejani and I'm a fellow chartered accountant by profession. Um, I did my CA um, back in 2005 and since then I've worked in various financial institutions um, at various positions, including CFO and GM Finance. And, um, you know, in, in 2018, we, you know, when I, I had left my job for another fintech uh, startup, I faced a real challenge, which was filing my own return. Until I was CFO of a company, we used to have tax consultant on board of the company and, uh, you know, they would take care of the filing. So when I um, tried to do it on my own, because I thought, you know, why end up paying 25000 when I, being an accountant, already know the tax law. So I thought I'll file it myself. But it turned out to be a really cumbersome process. I couldn't even get started. And I had to ask a friend who used to do his own filing. And, uh, and then only I realized that, you know, it's not just a knowledge of text that you need to have, but uh, you also need to know the interface. Because text filing is not, you know, a simple user-friendly interface that you commonly see when you're, you know, buying a car or renting a car through Uber, Kareem, or, or buying groceries through online portals. So it turned out that, you know, it, it isn't really, although it's online, but it's not as easy as you would think. And there were a lot of technical jargons and uh, you had to know where exactly you have to enter the number. Even though you knew what to enter, you had to know where to enter that number. So it uh, turned out that, you know, I was not the only one who was facing trouble. And imagine a person who doesn't have the text knowledge, besides not having any experience of using the interface. So that was the problem I came across and, uh, you know, uh, my co-founder, Mudassir Jokhyo, um, he, he's the guy who was into the tech. So I'm the finance guy, he's the tech guy. So we, you know, decided to address this problem and we conducted a bit of, um, you know, research and found out that, you know, it's a very genuine problem. And unlike Western countries, we do have um, online portals for these kind of stuff. I mean, you, you can't imagine that a country like USA doesn't have an online tax filing portal. In USA, if you have to file your return, you have to either uh, download the form, fill it up and send it to IRS, or use an online portal or use the services of um, a CPA. So, I mean, Pakistan is, uh, you know, advanced in a way that it has an online portal, but then it has certain issues in terms of user experience and the knowledge. So we thought, you know, why not have a TurboTax for Pakistan? Because, you know, in USA, they have TurboTax, they have HR and block. In our neighboring country, they have clear tax. So we thought that's a real gap in Pakistani market. And at that time, and even today as we speak, there's no such uh, digital online tax platform which can take care of your tax filing. So that was the problem that we faced and, you know, thought of uh, developing our own. I used to do tax returns. Uh, so what I do know is like what you can do with the IRS is uh, you can, like you said, you can, you know, enter the information, print it out and send it to the IRS or you have to use TurboTax. But the reason for that is it's, it's, a, it's a more political uh, response to that. Basically, it's a, it's a very big lobby here uh, that makes sure that the taxes stay very complicated and IRS can never become f completely free filing. But in any case, uh, I just wanted to you know throw it out there. But yeah, so that's the first thing that I thought of when I looked at BFiler. I'm like, okay, there, you guys are building, uh, you know, basically TurboTax for Pakistan, and it's going to save a lot of time for a lot of people. But then again, you are also doing other services besides just, you know, having, you know, someone file a tax return. So w was there a reason to be like this one 
shop for everything, uh, both business and individual? Or did you start off by thinking, okay, we will start off by just doing tax prep, but then we will move on to, you know, the NTN registration or sales tax registration? Typically, an accounting firm would provide all sorts of uh, services that uh, related that relate to tax filing and related stuff. I mean, a sales tax is obviously um, is, is a tax component. But when we started, we never thought that, you know, we'll be expanding and, uh, you know, uh, focusing on those areas so soon. But as we started, a lot of businesses who, you know, came to us for tax filing needs also approached us if we could, you know, help them in uh, registering their businesses, incorporating their companies or taking care of their sales tax filing. So along the way, I mean, we had the experience, we had professional resources at our disposal, but uh, we, you know, uh, here and there we would uh, support them in in taking care of their compliance needs. And eventually we realized that, uh, you know, this is again something that we, uh, you know, we wanted to do it anyways, but it it uh, we had to get there sooner than later. When you start a digital or tech-enabled company, there are a few advantages of offering these services. Um, you know, when you go for exponential growth, you have to have a complete digitization and automation. And besides that, it has to offer certain um, advantages, including demonetization, which, you know, reduces your fee because the technology is taking care of the calculation and everything. So the benefit should pass on to the user. Similarly, we are, you know, uh, we go for democratization because, you know, uh, typically a person will have to find a chartered accountant or a tax consultant to take care of his filing, which would, you know, charge a lot of fees and he will be difficult to get hold of during tax season. So with this digital platform, we had a wider range of market and the service uh, charges were very low. So because of those added advantages, uh, we started attracting a lot of businesses who who needed help for these kind of services. So we had thought of these services, but we had to start or jump to these uh, services sooner than we had decided. And, you know, um, it turns out because these are premium kind of premium services for businesses, the the average revenue per customer and uh, you know the profitability in some way uh, improved with the with the introduction of these services was there a specific reason you felt that it's better to raise funding because you know when uh, when I, I think of a you know a business um, especially one that has the advisory component to it um, I, I would think that you would be like you know your you you would be at certain point you would become profitable and it wouldn't be a business where you're losing money right so was there a specific reason you felt that if you raised funding you would be able to like do XYZ as I said when you are running a fintech uh, something that takes a lot of uh, costs is your technology component a typical accounting firm would not need to hire technology people and would not have to have uh, you know uh, a technology based operational infrastructure so with these kind of costs in place it was really difficult to uh, you know s- sustain the kind of cost that we are incurring and um, when you are looking for exponential growth i mean a, typically an accounting firm would take anywhere between 5 to 10 years to uh, you know um, uh, generate a reasonable amount of revenue to build a name for itself. But when you're going for exponential growth, I mean, every year we are getting anywhere between five to ti- 10 times of the customers compared to last year, you need to, you know, the, uh, sustain these operations through funding. Because with, with, as I said, with technology and with additional operational cost to maintain and support that kind of scalability, you need funding. We are still burning money. I mean, that's typical of a fintech that uh, in the years uh, that you are going for exponential growth, you have to burn a lot of money to, especially for two components. Number one is uh, the digital p- platform, and number two is the the marketing part, where you go for you know outreach and uh, brand awareness to 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 get the results that a typical firm would get anywhere in ten to uh, five to ten years. So that's the reason we 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 felt that you know. We should raise funds and go for exponential growth and continue this momentum rather than slow down our pace and, uh, you know, go for uh, sustainability. Before I move on to the next question, uh, one last follow-up on funding. How long did the whole process take you uh, from the point where you started pitching investors to the point where you closed the funding? Typically, I, you probably think it would take three to six months, but in our case, it took us almost uh, 12 months. 
uh, from the point we started. Reason being, we are looking for a, uh, a decent valuation. We took our own sweet time. We did not go for their funding right away when we started. We, we gave it at least uh, two, two and a half years before we actually went out for seeking funding. And we, uh, we wanted to raise funding at a decent valuation so that uh, the founders are diluted as low as possible in, in, in the idea so that we have some room for further dilution when we go for the next round. When it comes to mostly service or advisory based businesses, uh, there's very low barrier to entry, right? Like anyone can start a business. But since like you mentioned, you're building a fintech, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're using the money or whatever you have earned so far, you have, you know, spent it on building the infrastructure, the tech stack. Right. So besides building your own tech stack and b- besides building, like having that as a competitive advantage, is there anything else you feel that you bring to the table where it makes you different from and you know uh, future competitors or competitors that are in the market right now? Not really. I mean, uh, the only thing that we bring to the table right now is that we are the first. Uh, we have first movers advantage. It took us a lot of time to understand users' behavior when it comes to text filing. It's not a typical sort of solution. And when you think of taxes, you would want to meet your lawyer and, you know, discuss him in confidence about a lot of things. But when you're asked to fill in your details on a digital portal, you're not always uh, getting what you, uh, you know, would typically expect. So that's the reason uh, we feel that anyone who wants to come in this space will have to spend a lot of time uh, in understanding the market and building a portal like this. It took us almost one and a half years to develop the technology stack. So, I mean, anyone who would want to come in this space would have to first uh, um, develop the, the portal, which, uh, by the way, changes every year because of the changes in tax law. So we, every year we keep on updating and not just that. As we are growing, we are also working on automation, automating a lot of back-end processes as well. So this is something that we feel that over the years we'll have uh, far superior advantage in terms of uh, our competition, any new entrants. And uh, given the, uh, you know, I would not say the market is market size is very low, but still it's not as high as you would reckon for any other country. In Pakistan, text-to-GDP ratio is very low out of, you know, a population of 25 million, there are only 2.5 million filers. And it's only done once in a year. So, I mean, if we haven't attracted a lot of competition and we don't expect a lot of competition in this space from any meaningful uh, sort of fintech because it's, uh, you know, uh, the market is not very uh, huge. And, uh, you know, it, it takes time for anyone to come up with a solution uh, and, uh, fight for a very small chunk of business. So like you mentioned, like it took you some time to build the tech stack or to build the tech tech behind it. Uh, At any point, did you face any issues with the the government, the FBR, where you were having like back and forth and either the technology that you were building is something that you had a hard time explaining to them that is to what you're building or were there any privacy issues or were there any roadblocks in terms of like FBR coming in saying you can't do this, you can't do that? Not really. When we had initially launched this portal, the, uh, the previous government had just come in. And when we told them that we have developed a solution like this, uh, they welcomed us and they connected us with Prowl to, you know, get integrated. Um, and we actually integrated with them under sandbox environment. But, you know, uh, there were a lot of changes in the government from time to time, especially in FBR. So we couldn't really go live. We are again in the process of going live, hopefully soon. But uh, at that time, uh, the government had to focus on uh, increasing the tech space. So... There was something that, you know, when we launched this portal and showed it to them, they really liked the idea. And um, while they were connecting with us, they also came up with their own portal with the name of Asan Text to facilitate, uh, um, you know, uh, small taxpayers in filing their tax return through a tax wizard, which had an interface which was very similar to B-Filers at that time. Uh, although they could not scale it up because uh, it catered to a very small segment of taxpayers with you know a small salary, no wealth reconciliation details and stuff like that. It it uh, it has its own issues, but they did try to uh, copy our idea and uh, you know 
uh, market it at that point in time. So one of the interesting things that I learned uh, when I was on the website was that you also provide services like, you know, incorporation in the US uh, as well as, you know, other things. Was there a reason for doing that? Were customers coming to you and asking you about that service? Yes. So when, you know, uh, lately there's a lot of... Um, a boom in terms of uh, forming companies, especially for the businesses which are operating through Amazon. So the biggest challenge that they were facing was uh, incorporating the company and then opening the bank account and meet, uh, meeting the compliance needs. Um, being a professional firm, we already had some expertise, but we you know, continued to receive uh, queries from clients that if we could help them through our counterparts in the USA to form companies, and we did assist them. Uh, initially. And then we realized that, you know, it's a decent market and there's a lot of potential. So eventually we hired our own professionals who had experience of forming companies and, uh, you know, filing tax returns in the US. And now we are offering these services from Pakistan. The good thing about that service is, uh, you know, because of the economic and political condition in Pakistan, the businesses have slowed down in Pakistan. And, uh, you know, because of that, nobody is really keen to remain compliant in terms of their ongoing filing. But this business, obviously, if you are doing business in USA, you're more careful about these things uh, and, and ensuring that you are compliant. So we feel that this is an area that we would want to expand to. And uh, um, given the fact that the fees are in dollars, we will not be uh, taking hit on the inflation either. Because in Pakistan, I mean, we, we're charging a very nominal fee of, uh, we were initially charging 2,500 rupees. This year only, we increased our fee to 2650, only an increase of 150 rupees, despite a huge inflation. And even then, we, we are also offering um, free insurance, that uh, accidental insurance coverage of up to 500,000. And the premium cost is more than 150 rupees, far more than 150 rupees. But we are still offering that services to, you know, encourage people to come in TextNet and avail these kind of uh, services to protect their uh, loved ones. So the idea is to uh, keep those services at a nominal uh, for offering these services for a nominal fee, and then uh, recoup part of the uh, operating cost that we are incurring through those services in USA. So how would how big is your team like, and how many people currently are working with you, and are you like currently hiring? So we have a team of uh, 107 as we speak. Often there are at least 45 people who are in the business uh, side, I mean, in terms of profession services, and there are almost 30 people in technology side. So we are fairly, uh, you know, uh, I mean, rightly staffed as we speak. We are looking for t people in, in, in U.S. services and other, uh, you know, areas of profession services, but not in technology stuff at the moment because we're already... Uh, you know, we've already hired people that we're looking for and uh, we're only hiring at the moment for, for, for the replacements. Besides, you know, dealing with like a technology as well as like the FBR, was there a challenge that you feel like was a big thing for you when you started working on it? Maybe you didn't assume or maybe you had certain knowledge about this issue, but when you started working on it, it became a bigger challenge. And what was it? Managing scalability turned out to be an issue. I mean, when you're growing up, you don't realize that you know there are certain things that you can do manually but over the period when the uh, when you when you scale up you realize that this cannot be done manually and it shouldn't be done manually so over the years um, at least especially uh, for the last one year uh, given the fact that we had received a lot of uh, traction in 2021 we felt that you know we need to uh, pace up and um, allow our operations to work uh, digitally, and we have been working uh, on backend modules a lot lately, and that has allowed us to handle the pressure that we handled during tax year 22. In 2021, we had to actually stop marketing during peak tax season because we couldn't handle the pressure that we had. And uh, this year, we were, alhamdulillah, able to file all the tax returns. We didn't stop marketing. We were able to cater to all the clients. Uh, that we, you know, uh, that approached us and uh, were able to complete their tax returns in time. So that was something we feel that operations sometimes, uh, if you're a fintech and you're growing in a, a, at an exponential pace, we have to make sure that you continue to manage the scalability over the period 
uh, in terms of operations. I'm just curious because you mentioned, uh, you know, you had like had so much pressure and you had so many you know clients coming in. Um, out of all the clients that you see, what is the like, you know, uh, since you mentioned that, you know, there's a very low percentage of population that pays taxes, right? What population do you see approaching you uh, as asking to file tax returns? Are they single people? Are they families? Are they newly married? Are they like old people? Like which, what segment of the society is eager to file their tax returns? In terms of uh, occupation, most of our uh, tax filers are salaried individuals. Reason being the tax is already deducted at source and they're more inclined to be compliant because they don't want to end up paying more taxes on other areas uh, where they're subject to double taxation. For example, uh, if you have kept some saving in a bank account or in a mutual fund or in stock market, you will be subject to double taxation that is from 15% to 30%, 30% on your profit on bank deposit, on your dividend, on your capital gain, stuff like that. So if you're a salaried individual, you're already paying taxes at source. So you might as well file your tax returns so that you don't end up paying taxes on other sources of income, which are subject to double taxation. And in terms of uh, age, it's mostly between uh, 30 to uh, 45, I would say. Reason being, when you are around 25, 26, your, your salary is not high enough to, to attract any taxes. So after 30, you start attracting taxes. And then 30 to 45, because these are the people who are more technology, uh, technologically literate. After 45, people who are already 45 are, you know, they tend to uh, approach a consultative person and they're not very familiar with the digital solutions. So they end up going to uh, tax lawyers in person. But our, our target market is young population, the millennials, who are very familiar with digital solution and would rather not go to a bank to bank to uh, you know do their transactions. They rely on solutions like Easy Pesa, Jazzcash, or Sada Pay. Similarly, uh, you know, as I said, salaried individual is our most uh, most uh, uh, significant component of uh, uh, customers. But then businesses have lately been coming to us for their other business needs, not just tax filing, but other compliance needs. But it, it forms a small population when you uh, look at it as a percentage of total population. So one last question before I let you go. Um, where do you see yourself in like the next five, next 10 years? Well, we are already uh, the leader in text filing space, but uh, we feel that, you know, Pakistan has a lot of potential and given our, uh, you know, huge, huge uh, market force and especially the, uh, the young generation, we feel that we can not just cater to Pakistani market, but we can also start offering our services internationally. So we do intend to, uh, you know, tap international markets, um, especially the Middle East and North America. And we feel that, you know, it, it, we have no reason to doubt that it will be a unicorn in, 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 in the years to come. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, a best of luck uh, for the future. And it was a pleasure talking to you and learning more about your journey so far and what you're building. Being part of that same industry, sort of, I'm really excited that you're building something very similar to TurboTax. And I wish you all thank the best. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the time and inviting me. Thanks for listening to the Missal podcast. I hope you enjoyed the podcast and will thank me by writing a review or sharing it on social media. Make sure you follow and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Thanks again. See you soon.